The Psychic type is home to some of the biggest brains in all of Pokemon, and the smallest. Psychic is useless against Dark types, and the Galar region has a Dark Rival, Dark Team, and Dark Gym, so I decided to try a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Shield with only Psychic types. But before I start, only 10% of my audience has a big Alakazam sized brain. If you're one of the 90% with a Slowpoke brain who is not subscribed already, there's still hope. Do yourself a favour, click the subscribe button now and your brain will quadruple in size. The results speak for themselves, do it now. Anyway, the full hardcore Nuzlocke rules will be in the description, but in short, if a Pokemon faints, it's gone for good. I'm limited in the Pokemon that I can catch, and I won't be able to level my team higher than the next gym leader's ace. The starter that I choose is mostly irrelevant, so I make the based decision and pick Grookey. Grookey gang in the comments. I never noticed it before, but both Hop and Leon are wearing wool. Do they shear Wooloo? Oh god, that is cursed. Over in Wedgehurst, I'm able to catch my true starter Pokemon for this challenge, Slowpoke. Some people have book smarts, others have street smarts, but Slowpoke has a nice smile. I decided to give him the nickname Pokerface. It's kind of weird that the professor has a statue of Hop in her house, isn't it? Over in the wild area, under my rule set, I'm able to get one encounter now, and one additional encounter for each gym badge that I obtain. By heading over to the rolling fields under the right weather conditions, I'm guaranteed to find a Rolls. It's a male one too, so I'll have the option of whether I want it to evolve into a Gardevoir or Gallade. Who would you choose? Let me know in the comments. I gave Rolts the nickname Wally. It's a really valuable Pokemon, as its secondary fairy typing will help me deal with those deadly dark types. Before leaving the wild area, I'm able to grab the leftovers and give this to Slowpoke to complement its natural bulk. Now in Motorstoke for my first real challenge of the run, three consecutive battles against Team Yell and their dark types. I'm reliant on Rolts to do most of the heavy lifting here, but fortunately, Disarming Voice hits pretty hard. The double battle with Hop is a little scary, but my Orenberry keeps me healthy and I make it through my first encounter with Team Yell unscathed. A quick outfit change into the Psychic type uniform and this gives me some strong White Rabbit vibes. The Galar Mine gives me my next encounter, Bruce Wayne the Wubat. Bede is an interesting rival as he also uses Psychic types. He leads with a very passive Solosis, so I can put it to sleep and set up a few double teams. From here, Bede's team can't hit me and I clean up the rest of his team. After catching Trinity the Eevee on Route 4, I furiously shake a stick at my Pokemon, cook some curry, and play fetch until they love me. This lets my Woobat evolve into Swoobat, and Eevee into Espeon. It's time for the first gym, but Milo's grass types shouldn't give me too much trouble. I lead with Swoobat, who is able to rely on its flying type attacks to overpower Milo's team, giving me a very quick win. Over on Route 5, I'm faced once more by Team Yell, but they're much more dangerous this time. The first grunt has a Thievul, which lays down some huge damage with Snarl. Fortunately, my Espeon is pretty tanky, allowing me to land a few sand attacks before finishing Thievul with Quick Attack. After the battle, Rolts evolved into a Curlia. Look at those little feet taps. This made the second team Yell Grunt much easier. A single Dazzling Gleam was enough to give me the win. I'm also able to catch a Wobbuffet. I give it the nickname Uno Reverse, since its whole gimmick is deflecting your own moves right back at you. My next stop is Holbury to tackle the second gym, led by Nessa and her water Pokemon. I lead with Curlia, who I've taught Magical Leaf. I take a large chunk of damage in the process, but two of these attacks lets me finish Goldeen. Aracuda is fast and hits hard. I counter this by switching into Slowpoke and making use of Protect to increase my leftovers recovery. A Yawn puts Aracuda to sleep, allowing me to switch back into Curlia, who falls just short of taking it down with Magical Leaf. Luckily, Aracuda stays asleep, and a quick attack from Espeon finally finishes it off. Dreadnought is last, and it knows Bite, which will rip my team apart. I get around this by using Charm, lowering Dreadnought's attack by two stages. After some Orenberry recovery, I risk a crit and go for another Charm, just hanging on. Slowpoke is bulky enough to stall out the last Dynamax turn, and a few counters from Wobbuffet lets me eventually finish the Dreadnought. I had to risk a few crits in that fight, but luck was on my side. That's the second badge. The second Galar Mine has me rematch with Bede, but this isn't too much trouble. Curlia can overpower the first two Pokemon, and since Bede's last two are special attackers, Wobbuffet's Mirror Coat helps me handle those. The next battle, however, is a very different story. I team up with Hop to battle Team Yell in a double battle. This is high risk, and you never know what Hop is going to contribute, and Team Yell could both attack me. And that's exactly what happens. In one turn, Curlia is reduced to low HP. 
I'm forced to switch and go into Swooba, but they do the exact same thing again. Switching once again, I send out my tanky Slowpoke and Hop finally makes the right call, finishing Lanoon with a double kick. But on the next turn, Thievul lands a big snarl, finishing my poor Slowpoke in one shot. Espeon and Wobbuffet were able to finish the fight without any extra casualties, but that's a devastating loss. I had such high hopes for our dopey little starter Pokemon. Rest easy, Pokerface. With death comes new life, and a short time later in the Motorstoke outskirts, I'm able to catch a Hatsuna that I nickname Hermione. It's pretty weak at the moment, but it'll be more useful once it evolves. But my troubles weren't all behind me. Next is a battle with Marnie, who is undoubtedly my biggest challenge so far. Her more Peko could decimate my team, so I'll need to put together a strategy to counter it. I've taught Espeon a few support moves, and lead with it against Krogunk. Krogunk will try to sucker punch me, but this move fails unless I'm also attacking. I take advantage of this to land a charm for free. From here, two swifts take it down. This brings out Scraggy, who's another physical attacker. Some charms lower its attack, while leftovers and protect help keep me healthy. Once Scraggy is at minus 6 and low health, Espeon sets up Reflect just before Scraggy goes down. With Reflect lowering more Peko's physical damage, Espeon can land two charms. Then with the little health that it has remaining, Espeon sets up another Reflect. With more Peko significantly nerfed, a switch into Curlia is pretty safe, and two Dazzling Gleams give me the win. That battle was insane. Soon after, it's time for the third gym battle against Kabu and his fire types. This is going to be another challenging fight, as he's got three fully evolved Pokemon, and I don't have much to work with. Against his Ninetales, I send out Curlia and put it to sleep with Hypnosis. After chipping away with two Psybeams, I switch into Espeon, who finishes Ninetales with two Psybeams of its own. Since Arcanine is a physical attacker, a few charms tames that big puppy, and I can start landing some hits. The residual burn damage starts to add up though, so after setting up Reflect, it's time to send in the Batman. He too is burned, but finishes Arcanine off. Last is Center Scorch, and since it's a part bug type, my plan is to Dynamax and take it down with a super effective max airstream. Sadly, I fall short of taking it down in two hits, and Center Scorch's G Max move prevents me from switching. This, combined with burn and fire spin damage, ultimately spells the end of Bruce. With the Dynamax now over, one counter from Wobbuffet finishes the fight. I'd gotten my third badge, but with two deaths in quick succession, the team was starting to fall apart. Fortunately, with three new badges since my last wild area visit, I've got a few encounters up my sleeve to find some new troops. First up is Baltoy, who I bestow the nickname of Claystation 2. My next catch is Pharaoh the Sigilith. And my final wild area encounter for now was a Bronzor that I nicknamed Frisbee. You might have noticed that they all had a serious nature. That's because my Espeon has the Synchronize ability, which has a chance to pass its nature onto the Pokemon that I catch. It's not overly vital or anything, I'm just happy with the neutral natures. After arriving in Hammerlock, Curlia reached level 30 and evolved. Oh poor Gardevoir, the internet has ruined you. Team Yell step up for a rematch, but my newly evolved Gardevoir can handle them without much trouble. While on Route 6, I had a Clefable use Metronome and rolled Blue Flare under harsh sunlight. That could have been deadly. Other than that, Route 6 was pretty clean, bringing me to Stolen Side. Hop wants a rematch, and hits me with multiple crits, but it's still not that close of a battle, so let's move on. While training, I was able to evolve a few of my Pokemon, giving me a nice stat boost just in time for the next gym. But before that, I had to get past this gym trainer who gave me a lot of trouble. His Drift Blim knows Shadow Force, which is really threatening. Luckily, the AI went for a Shadow Ball, and Sigilyph barely hung on and could finish the fight with Psybeam. With that scare out of the way, my next opponent is the ghost type gym leader, Alistair. Ghost is another type that's super effective against Psychic, so this fight is a huge concern. My plan is to use his Yun Mask lead to set up. After putting it to sleep with Hypnosis, I switch into Claydol and begin using Cosmic Power to buff both of my defenses. Pairing this with the leftovers and substitute turns my Claydol into a tank. I then use Power Trick, which is basically the Shield and Sword Yu-Gi-Oh card, flipping my attack and defense stats. With this setup, Yun Mask goes down with ease. This is where things started to go wrong. I wasn't expecting Cursler to be next, and while it KO'd itself in the process, Claydol was afflicted with a curse. I can't keep it in anymore, and will need to shift my strategy. A switch into Espeon and a few charms lets me bring Mimikyu to minus 6 attack and break its disguise. This gives me a safe switch into Gardevoir, who finishes Mimikyu off with a Moonblast. 
Last is Gengar, and we both Dynamax, but fortunately, as it's weak to Psychic moves, one Max Mindstorm finishes the fight and gives me badge number 4. That ended up being a little scrappy. Bead commits some crimes against the arts, and it's my job to enforce the law. Thing is, Bronzong is a defensive tank with a great typing to counter Bead. I can spam Heavy Slam, which does more damage the heavier you are. And in case you haven't noticed, Bronzong is a big unit. He weighs 187 kilograms, which, when converted to the Imperial system, comes out to about 64 Caterpies. Squashed him. But sadly, I was too late to save the wall. Oh yeah! Into the Glenwood Tangle, where I find a Ponyta, which I nickname... Mabroni. Bolonia is my next stop, where I'll be taking on Opal and her Fairy types. This fight is another Bronzong slam fest. A few Iron Defenses to set up, followed by a Heavy Slam, and Opal's team just can't keep up. I squashed her lovely cake, and for that, I'm rewarded with the fifth badge. It's a clean knockout. Ring the bell. Back to Hammerlock. Hop has had an absolute gut full of my psychic types, and has tweaked his team to be my worst nightmare. He's included a Bolton with a strong draw ability and crunch. That combination is chaos for my team. I needed a plan, and in search of wisdom, I headed into the forest of focus. And then I found the answer right in front of me, the Guru. If you don't know much about Oranguru, he's awesome, and I'm about to show you why. Hop's new lead is a Trevenant, which is dangerous in its own right, as Shadow Claw hits hard. My plan is to lead with Espeon and use multiple charms to nerf its attack. After setting up Reflect, it's Guru time. First, I set up a few nasty plots to give me a huge special attack boost. I'm then able to set up Trick Room, which reverses the order in which Pokemon move for 5 turns. This means that for a short time, my slow, heavy-hitting Guru becomes a fast powerhouse. To top this off, I've also got the move Stored Power, which increases damage based on your stat boosts. Since my special attack is maxed, this move has a base power of 140. This combination destroys Hop's team, and I'm able to sweep without letting his dangerous bolt and lay a paw on me. Thank you, Guru. We are truly not worthy. On my way to the next city, I've got a few encounters available. On Route 7, I caught a Meowstic, followed by a Lunatone on Route 8. These routes bring me to Sir Chester City for the next gym. The puzzle has me navigate some pitfalls, and this trainer gives me a huge scare. His Avalug landed a critical hit crunch, and I think my heart skipped a beat. That was close. Melanie's Ice types are threatening, but Lunatone is a huge asset for this gym. I've given it the Choice Scarf, and can one-shot Melanie's Frostmoth with a 4 times effective Power Gem. Darmanitan deals some big damage with Icicle Crash, but a second Power Gem takes care of it. With Lunatone low, I switch into Bronzong, who's bulky enough to render Ice Q useless, and a few heavy slams take it down. Last is Lapras, and my goal is to stall out the Dynamax. A few max guards help me do just that. Now back to regular size, I start chipping away at Lapras with heavy slam. Bronzong's HP starts to dwindle, forcing me to switch. I go with Gardevoir, who comfortably tanks a few Surfs to finish the battle with a few Moon Blasts. Pretty clean overall, badge number 6 is in the bag. Route 9 gives me the chance to catch an Inke, which will be huge for the next gym. I then farmed some Colber Berries in the wild area to help too. But before that, Marnie wants a rematch. She was really dangerous in our last encounter. Gardevoir quickly handles Lipard with a Moon Blast, bringing Toxicroak out. It's only attacking moves at Poison type, as well as Sucker Punch. The former doesn't affect Steel types, and I can dodge the latter by not attacking. This can be abused by setting up Bronzong and using Iron Defense to max my defense while draining Toxicroak's Sucker Punch PP. Since Marnie's team is highly physical, Bronzong can then sweep the rest of the fight with Heavy Slam. That was way easier than our last fight. This lets me enter Spikemeth to tackle the 7th gym. Piers uses Dark-type Pokemon, which is very scary, and I've made sure to prepare for this fight by loading up my team with Colber Berries. I've also subbed in Hatcherum, who evolved into Hatterene, as well as Inkay, who evolved into Malamar by flipping my console upside down. Malamar is my secret weapon for this gym. Its contrary ability means that any stat changes are reversed. This can be combined with Super Power, a 120 base power fighting move that lowers your attack and defense with each use. See where this is going? Each time Malamar uses Super Power, its attack and defense will be increased. This combination makes very light work of Piz's gym, turning one of the hardest fights into the easiest. That's busted. Straight after, I'm free to head back to Hammerlock to take on the final gym right away. A double battle against Raihan is always scary, but I've got a plan in mind to minimize the damage. His Flygon knows Crunch, which makes it a huge threat. 
To overcome this, I've given Gardevoir the Choice Scarf, allowing me to outspeed and one-shot Flygon with Moonblast. Claydol is my other lead, and I use Power Trick to flip my attack and defense. My plan is to fire off some powerful Earthquakes. This would normally hit my second Pokemon too, but a switch into my Levitate Lunatone prevents this. Earthquake chips away at Raihan's team, removing Gigalith. Sandaconda is a pest, paralyzing both of my Pokemon with Glare. As Duraludon emerges, my plan is to stall out the Dynamax with Lunatone. On the second Dynamax turn, however, both of Raihan's Pokemon target Lunatone, and I'm lowered to red health. I decided to take the risk, and fortunately wasn't paralyzed, allowing me to stall out the final Dynamax attack. After a few turns of paralysis, Claydol finally lands another Earthquake, finishing Sandaconda. It's a 2 on 1, but Duraludon is tough since it's increased its defense with max Steel Spike. I ultimately decided to switch into Malamar, who can tank an attack, and lands a superpower on the next turn to finish the fight. An extra paralysis turn would have spelled the end of Lunatone, but fortunately, I made it through and have earned the final gym badge. Route 10 awaits, and it's here that I find a Mr. Mime, but for whatever reason, I used Gyro Ball, which very quickly knocked it out. I was really tired at this point in my run. As further evidence of this, during the last trainer battle, I forgot about Togedemaru's Iron Barb's ability and knocked out my own Malamar. That was so dumb. At least I didn't forget to slap Cabby Jeffrey around for a laugh. I will slay your Flygon each and every time that I step up on this hill. Mistakes aside, I'd now made it to Winden for the Champions Cup. Ah, the most iconic Galar Pokemon. Rillaboom, Cinderace, and... Ball Guy? What? Marnie's up first, but this battle is a carbon copy of our last fight. Her Toxicroak is still rendered useless by Bronzong, and a few heavy slams takes out the rest of her team. You were a good rival in the early game, Marnie, but that Toxicroak has got to go. Next on the chopping block is our old pal, Hop. Besides that one battle, I haven't really shown Hop too much, as the battles against him have been pretty trouble-free. And this one is no exception. Espeon charms Dubwool, as well as uses Calm Mind, before Baton passing this to Oranguru. I can then use Psych Up, which copies double stat changes, giving me the huge Cotton Guard defense boost. After some nasty plots, I'm paralyzed by Body Slam, but my Lumberry heals this off. With Trick Room now up, the Guru's stored power is able to demolish Hop's team. Let me tell you, it was not pretty. After making my way past an absolute sea of macro cosmos grunts, I'll have to tackle Rose's sidekick, Oleana. She's really scary. Not her team or anything, I'm talking about those eyes. This battle isn't too dangerous. I lead with Lunatone and quickly remove Frostlass with Power Gem. Oleana sends out Milotic, but this is exactly what I wanted. A switch into Espeon lets me stack a bunch of Calm Mines before Baton passing these to the Guru. Once Trick Room goes up, the rest of the fight is a very familiar looking sweep. Why does this battle even happen? Leon isn't in any danger, and they're just talking. Anyway, Bede's back for another beatdown, and who am I to deny him? Unfortunately for Bede, Bronzong is still too much of a wall for him to overcome. Heavy Slam can remove his first three team members without any trouble. Last is Hatterene, and it even hits me with a critical hit Max Flare. I tank it comfortably due to my heatproof ability, and a second Max Steel Spike wins me the battle. I embarrassed Bede so badly that he became a Fairy-type trainer. Yikes. Those last few fights were very free, but the next ones are a little more challenging. The first gym leader rematch is against Nessa. Her Golisopod lead is troublesome, as it knows First Impression, a priority bug move that could be dangerous. It can only be used on the first turn though, so a Protect from Gardevoir counters this nicely. A single Thunderbolt puts Golisopod below half health, forcing it out thanks to its emergency exit ability. Seeking isn't too threatening, that is, until it landed a critical hit smart strike. I can finish it off with a second Thunderbolt on the next turn, but that's really annoying. Golisopod returns, but applying the same strategy as earlier lets me finish the job. My leftovers recovery is starting to accrue, so I feel confident enough to stay in against Barrascooter. I do tank a Throat Chop, and one Thunderbolt electrifies that fishy. I could take Pelipper out, but need to use it to set up before Ness's ace. First, a switch into Bronzong allows me to stall out the rain with Protect. This will stop the boost to Ness's water type moves. I then switch into Espeon, intending to boost my stats with Calm Mind, but a poorly timed critical hit from Pelipper really jeopardizes my plan. Despite this, I'm still able to set up a Calm Mind, and by timing my Baton Pass perfectly, I can bring Gardevoir out just as Tailwind ends. From here, a Thunderbolt cleans up Pelipper, and a single 4 times effective max overgrowth can finish Dreadnought instantly. The critical hits made that a little messy, but I got there in the end. 
The next fight is against Alistar, and this one is much cleaner. His super passive Dusknaw lead is very exploitable. This lets me use my standard Oranguru Trick Room setup to decimate Alistar's team with no worries. The Guru is just the gift that keeps on giving. The final gym leader rematch is against Raihan, and this team is a real mixed bag. First is Torkoal who sets up the sun, but I quickly have Espeon do a rain dance to change the weather. I get crit by body press and put to sleep by yawn. However, I'm still able to set up two calm mines and baton pass these to Gardevoir. It should be a clean sweep with Moonblast from here, but I forgot to relearn the move. Ugh. With my boosts, I can still remove Torkoal with Psychic, as well as Turdinator. Gudra goes down too, and Flygon follows soon after. But it's Duraludon who's the real problem. We both Dynamax, and I max Guard to try and stall. I don't want to risk a crit on Gardevoir, so switch into Bronzong, who thankfully can stall out the remaining Dynamax turns with its huge bulk. My only attacking move is Heavy Slam though, so Bronzong won't be able to deal much damage to Duraludon. I pivot around to try and find an opening, but an Earthquake from Claydol still isn't enough. Running out of options, I switch into the Guru, who survives just long enough to set up Trick Room. This gives me a pretty safe switch into Hatterene, who moves first thanks to the Trick Room, finishing Duraludon with a Choice Specs Dazzling Gleam. That fight was really messy, solely due to my own forgetfulness. Shock Villains reveal, and the bad man is doing bad things, so I must do good things to stop the bad things. I think that's the plot. After securing the help of everyone's favourite big red dog, I'll be tackling Rose in a showdown. If you've seen my other Galar Nuzlocks, this strategy should be pretty familiar. Bronzong is holding a heat rock, meaning that Sunny Day will bring about a harsh sunlight for 8 turns. I then use Weather Ball, which becomes a fire type move to sweep through his first 4 Pokemon, but can't take Copperaja out. Bronzong falls, but I've got Espeon in the back, who can take over with a Weather Ball of its own to finish the fight. Bronzong is a huge loss. Please rise for a 10 bell salute out of respect. Rest easy, Frisbee. But we can't stop to mourn just yet, because Eternatus is loose and looking to conduct some criminal activities. Anyway, Eternatus knows three special moves and one physical move. It should always use one of the special ones, as these will do more damage to my Wobbuffet. As such, a Mirror Coat should give me a clean win. Are you kidding me? Why? My plan was foolproof, but I guess Eternatus is a fool. I pivot around to try and find an opening, but it's when Eternatus tries to use a dragon move on Gardevoir that I realise this AI is completely random. How do I play against this thing? After seeing that, I throw Caution to the wind and keep Gardevoir in and land a Psychic. But of course, on the next turn it lands a Cross Poison. I'm done. Claydol finishes the battle with an Earthquake, and I can't even begin to digest what that was. Help. The Mighty Morph and Eternatus goes into its extra large mode, but fortunately, my plan works this time. Wobbuffet successfully lands a Mirror Coat to send Eternatus back to the Shadow Realm. With everything else taken care of, the Champion Leon was the final hurdle for my big brain psychic types to overcome. Leon's Aegislash is deadly, but it goes for King's Shield on turn 1, allowing Espeon to set up two Calm Mines. I can then baton pass these boosts to Oranguru. The switch is entirely free, as Leon uses Shadow Ball, but Oranguru's secondary normal type makes it immune. After setting up Nasty Plot and Trick Room, the Guru is in his element. With stored power in my arsenal, I'm able to quickly remove Aegislash, Haxorus, Cinderace, and Seismitoad. My Trick Room expires, but thanks to my buffed special defense, Oranguru can tank an attack from Dragapult to set up a second Trick Room. With the Guru at max power, I can clean up the last two Pokemon on Leon's team while underleveled and without Dynamaxing. I had a lot of fun with this challenge. The Psychic type has some quirky moves like Trick Room and Power Trick, which made my strategies pretty unique. If you want to see more Monotype Nuzlocke challenges, check the playlist that I've linked in the description. If not, jump into one of these videos. But before you leave, click subscribe for me below. It's completely free and really helps me out. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video.